Welcome to Green Building Matters, the podcast that matters for green building professionals. Learn insight in green buildings as we interview today's experts in lead and well. We'll learn from their career paths, war stories, and all things green, because green building matters. And now our host, and yes, he has every lead and well credential, here's Charlie Cicchetti. Be sure to check out the Green Building Matters community, where you can have unlimited exam prep for any of the professional credential exams you're tackling next, as well as putting your continued education on autopilot, saving time with GBS reporting your hours on your behalf. Check it out, gbes.com slash join. Now, enjoy this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. I have a pretty fun job here when I go and put on my podcast hat because I interview a green building professional somewhere in the world, and we get to hear their story, how they get to where they are, what still inspires them, and even a glimpse at the future. So today I have a very special guest. This gentleman's become a very good friend of mine in this green building movement. We've done many master classes together. We've just encouraged each other as we're growing our businesses. And while I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, Emmanuel Powell's is in Barcelona, Spain. So Emmanuel, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Charlie, and nice to catch up with you. So I'm looking forward to this uh, chat together. Yeah, well, I, I can't wait to tap into your passion for not just green buildings, but especially regenerative design, the next chapter. I, I know you're dedicating everything to that. But to kind of tell our listeners, you know, where you had that origin, your origin story, Emmanuel, take us back. Where'd you grow up and where'd you go to school? Well, I'll... I'm I'm from Belgium, Charlie, and it's, it's a very small country the size of Delaware for those that live in the U.S. I grew up there, went to university, studied economic science, and I spent my summers working in, in fact, my father had a, a large international company, so I spent my summers working in the factories. So I spent some time in the U.S., in Missouri, spent some time in Ireland, lived in, in Indonesia for five years, working for the company... I uh, worked another 10 years for the company in Belgium. Again, came back to Belgium. But then finally, I, I sort of left because I needed, I had to, had to find my own way. So and then I went on a sabbatical, traveled to South America, and eventually ended up in Barcelona, renovated a house. Uh, and this was my first contact with real estate. I, before that, uh, and I was already in my 40s, I had nothing to do with real estate. I see. And that's when I slowly started, you know, to get an idea of what real estate was all about. I get interested. Did a long distance course at Harvard University on sustainable construction. They were talking about LEED, which was, which was still very American, was not as international. And I liked it. I said, oh, my God, there's some serious problems here in this industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's see what we can do. That's where you get the bug, as we say, for sustainable construction and design. And so is it safe to say that this is really almost a second career for you, this green building movement? Absolutely. It's my second life. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I didn't go to any university, you know, and I learned that you can learn everything today in different ways. You don't have to have a degree. Uh, you don't have to go to fancy universities. So it's just totally not necessary Learning has changed, education has changed, and there's so many ways you can get knowledgeable about something. Uh, and that's what I learned. So, yes, I am a lead AP and I've got all these accreditations, but that's, that's what I learned. You know, there's, there's different ways you can, you can really get knowledge and start working in, in any field you want. Well, I know you're an excellent teacher, and I think you live the motto I told you for the podcast here, which we have is teach everything you know, and I know you love to teach, and we'll get into it about your companies and how one side it's education, on the other side it's consulting, and and how to make just better buildings. But let's go back to that Harvard Extension class. So you said it was a sustainable construction. They introduced you to LEED. So was that the aha? And where were you at in your journey? So you knew you needed to go and do some of this yourself, you eventually became a consultant, help connect the dots from that, wow, this is a better way to do it, looks like this industry needs help. What was the next thing you did? The the real wow was when, because I was going back and forth to Indonesia a lot, uh, between Europe and Indonesia, and I was thinking about what I was going to do in the construction world, and I came across a guy in France, 
uh, sorry, a French guy in, in Indonesia, and he was manufacturing wooden prefabricated houses, and he was looking for someone, yeah, to develop those houses in Europe. And I thought, oh, that's that sounds cool. I like wood, I like nature. So yeah, and, and they could do any architectural style. And then there was a moment where I thought about this business. I went to all these trade shows about wood construction, which a lot of Germany and France. And then, and it's very different because I know you have wood as a construction material, as a structural material in the US, but it's not the case in Europe. And then one day I thought, okay, uh, this is the worst idea that I could possibly have. I'm going to get wood that is linked to deforestation, prefabricated by people in Indonesia that are not paid properly. I'm going to transport that wood to the other side of the world. So it's got all, you know, and, and that's when I say, no, 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 this can't be. Mm. And then with this course, which I was doing at the same time at, at the Harvard University, this whole lead system made so much sense to me. It was, and that's something, you know, Americans can do really, really well. It's like they got this very clear, easy to implement system, which covers all the items and I and this was still very new in Europe. I said this this is it. And I was looking at this industry with beginner's eyes. I'm not an architect, not an engineer, and it was a bit difficult at the beginning because they were speaking a certain jargon and language. Because I had, but I realized very quickly that all these sustainable issues are not part or were not part of their education. So there was a need to get updated on you know. On, on the this sustainability. You know, I'm, I'm happy that LEAD was that system that you were able to use. I know you've worked on many LEAD projects all through Europe, but you also work in other programs. Um, but I like to ask just people along the way, Emmanuel, uh, were there any mentors, anyone that you kind of looked up to, uh, maybe influenced you, maybe even opened the door for you? Not in my first career, Charlie. I'm not going to go back to my first career, but in my second career, yeah, definitely for me, Bill Reed, is one of the, you know, a guy which I adore and what he does and how he thinks. And with him, the work of the Seven Group, now Regenesis, uh, those people I've been following for the, since I started. I was like, I read one of the first books I read. I, I didn't get it back then. But the Integrated Design Guide, I still have it here, to Green Building. So it's all, it's been a Bible. Um, so th those, yeah, those people sure. uh, have always been my mentors. and. Um, and I'm it's taking important. classes with them now. Oh, and then it's come full circle to what's really even next. I know you're working on what's next. Um, but let's connect the career path dots a little bit. So, you know, you're a founder, you're an owner, you're an entrepreneur, but today you call yourself a regenerative practitioner. So just connect the dots and tell us more about your company's green living projects and green living education and your team in Europe. Well, I started in Didai myself doing consulting, got one job, another one, another one. And then so we started growing and the company I created was Green Living Projects. And recently I was reflecting on the name and it's still very relevant. Uh, the, the word living is in there. Uh, and even now we're moving towards more regenerative work. We've grown to a group of seven people. And yes, I must say I'm proud that today when I look back, with the work we do, we can support seven families financially, allowing them to do something they're really passionate about. And I remember when I started, I, I, my, some of the thoughts was, oh, my God, if I could just make a living for myself doing this kind of work. And, and that happened. And now we're seven and we could grow even more. But we've decided intentionally that our growth is going to be through collaboration. So we, we still have a lot of growth ahead of us but not by employing more people. We, we, we now believe really in setting up mutually beneficial relationships like the one we're having, Charlie, and just not by employing more people. So, but, and we've been doing sustainability. We keep doing sustainability. But I think what is, what is really changing in the projects that we're doing, if I look at mainly the last year, but, but looking forward, doing more projects that aim to create a systemic change. For instance, uh, we're now starting a project at the end of this month, a project, on, it's, a, it's a very large camping site with you know, bungalows and some pe new people bought this and they want to create a new place and they want to redefine tourism. Uh, instead of people coming there and yeah, you can be sustainable, you can leave less waste. They want to really regenerate the local area, create a different kind of economy, 
doing the same project, similar project, uh, same but same topic, a, a regenerative resort in Sri Lanka. Same kind of, you know, change. How does a resort, uh, how can it become regenerative and a force for creating more life, thriving communities locally? So how can you re redefine tourism? So that's, that's really changing. Projects with trying to uh, reach some systemic change. Another, there are other two topics which are really growing. And um, one is the relationship between the urban and, and rural areas. There are a lot of issues in, 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 in urban areas, and there's a lot of questions being asked in rural areas. So how can you reconnect those and give new meaning to that relationship? So that's another area. And then there is this whole area of people that want different lives. So the whole eco-villages, that's a whole movement which is really coming up. So in those areas, we see a lot of growth and a lot of people waking up realizing they need a, they need to do something a bit more conscious you know and we we still keep doing our 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 projects with lead certification but we're looking more for purpose and we can also see that investors are starting to look for more purpose as well and so helping projects you know they may not be re regenerative but at least bring more purpose to them Make sure they are applying the right processes. They ask the right questions. Bring in more skills. Uh, in the recent projects, we have brought in biologists, sociologists, permaculture designers. So that's why we don't want to grow in number of people. You know, you can hire all these skills, but you 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 have to have a network so you can bring them in when a project needs those skills to be present. Well, you've, you've got a great network. I know you know a lot of people and you can just pick up the phone and bring in that expert. You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, a program like LEAD, and I'd be curious in Spain, and I know you've done LEAD projects all over different parts of the world, but a lot of the podcast guests, I get an interview with Manuel, they say, look, LEAD's been a great tool for 20 plus years. You know, without it, we might not even have the progress we have. So, so if a client comes to you and says, hey, I've got a green building project, are they just assuming lead in, in Spain? Or no, you've got to coach them through all these different options. How does that conversation go today if a client comes to you with a project? Well, first of all, the landscape of building certifications has exploded. And there's a new one, you know, a new kid on the block, you know, every time. So before it was easier, you had a couple of major rating systems so the first thing we talk them through is like, let's look at the landscape of certifications. That's definitely, let's understand a little bit what's going on because it is confusing for a developer with all these new grading systems coming up. But our conversation with clients are more about what is the value that you are seeking and then how can we provide value? And is there, can certification add value to your project? That's the important question. If it can, then it makes sense. But let it not be a certification-led or driven project. Let it be a, a project that is driven by a strategic reflection and, and plan on, on how do we deal with sustainability and then find the right supporting tool to implement that. Uh, and that's a change And we have, because if a client, some clients said to me at one point, well, CEO of a developer company says, well, sustainability, we deal with it. We just say, we want lead platinum on this building. So we've done our work. I said, no, no, you have not done your work. This is a tool that can support you, but you haven't really thought about water, energy, materials. You got to think about this really more profoundly. And then as a consequence, you can just select maybe lead certification as a tool. There's many other tools in the market. So that's kind of the different... Uh, conversations we're having instead of saying, and I'm, I, I agree with you, Charlie, when we started, we are grateful for these rating tools because that's the reason we exist as a company. Otherwise, nobody would have listened to us and said, oh, what are you? No, no, this is a program. It's internationally recognized. So so that uh, credibility of the program helped us uh, be, you know, exist and get work. But now there are so many programs out there you know, it's it's on the second level. It's a, it's supporting something which needs to be thought of with with you know the right 
Yeah, thank you for giving us that visual. I've always admired how you run your green building projects. You and I have been fortunate for three or four years to teach a lead project immersion, a, a master class about lead for new construction or building design and construction. And we've seen the tools and how you coach on how someone should be an excellent lead project manager. So it's so important. I want to just repeat that for those listening is you're going to be tempted to just chase the certification and chase the points, but there's just so much more to it. There's just so much more to it here. So, okay, well, let's, let's take a look back. What are some of your proudest accomplishments? Well, I think there are two accomplishments, which, which I'm proud of. And the first one I think is, is my home, this home, Calgary. As far as the, you know, the, the, the profession, the work is concerned. And I think it's the physical manifestation of a new way of living. And for me, it is looking back, because we've, we've been doing this project for the last five years, it is the start of a transformation which goes way beyond what I could have imagined when I started this. And I'm excited to see, you know, to see what's coming next. So that physical building, that project really was like, uh, I'm very proud I've done it because it, it really is the beginning of a new way of being and working. And the second one, I, we, we touched upon it before. I mean, I'm also really proud we have this green, with Green Living Projects. I know it's not a big company, but it's seven people dedicated and, and it's, a, it's a bit of a community. It's like a family. And, you know, that seeing that as a viable system with a lot of vitality and, and, a, and a role where we can help projects doing better. So I think those would, for me, are personally, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of those two achievements. Yeah. Yes. Well, those are amazing. Thank you for taking us there. And I'll throw one more in, and then we'll talk about Cal Getro in just a minute in detail. Is uh, You've been named as a, you know, uh, a hero from the, you know, International Living Futures on that side. So just... You know, when I look up what they said about you, Emmanuel, and for those that don't know, you know, just the, the entire living building movement and the home that Emmanuel has been working on is uh, a living building, a living home. But the, they called you a tireless champion for the Institute and programs in Europe. And you actually help create living future Europe. So I wanted to throw that one in there. You've been called a living future hero. And I just, man, from me to you, uh, I think you understand the there's the business side of green buildings to to have a company and being an entrepreneur, but then there's also this side that I see you going all in on, which is, hey, no, 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 strategically, even for your business and your employees, you're over here with living buildings and regenerative design and the things that we still need to do to really uh, repair you know some of the damage done to our planet. So I just want to say, you know, I'm proud of you for doing that. You know, when, you know, we, we talk about it a lot, you know, in the U.S., capitalism and, and just where you're at and you're able to provide for these employees and families and still do the right thing. And there's always that tug of war, right? Back and forth, that, that tug of war. So let's talk about Cal Gercho. So for those that this is the first time they're hearing of Emmanuel and this amazing project, I guess it's what, two and a half, three hours outside of Barcelona in the mountains. Can you give us uh, a little background about this project, uh, where it's located, and, and uh, why it's so important to you? It's a project, like you said, it's three hours uh, north, west of Barcelona. It's at 800 meters altitude. Uh, that's what, 2,500 feet or something. In the mountains, Pyrenees, beautiful, surrounded by nature. And I, um, it's an existing medieval home. It's about, I think, originally the first stones were put together about a thousand years ago wow. it had a previous renovation because it was it ended up in ruin and and my my id i was i was in touch with living building challenge i liked that those ideas and i and i was going to renovate this home and and i wasn't planning on renovating a lot more homes i thought that's the one and so i i thought to myself well if if i really want to promote and be an advocate for this vision of how we should build, and I have no other option than just do it, try it myself. And it's called Living Building Challenge. And so I said, okay, well, probably it's probably a challenge. So my team got excited about it. 
a lot of other people uh, we got involved because it's not just me. We, no, just we got a whole team, and um, so yeah, we, and, and we learned a lot on the way. And what 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 is the outcome of the project? Well, there's the physical infrastructure. It's net positive on energy. So we produce 12% more energy than we consume on you know on an animal basis. It works 100% with rainwater. Uh, it's disconnected from any other source of water. It doesn't contaminate all the black water is being treated on site. And it um, th- those are the you know the performances, water energy, but materials as well was was the most challenging. Um, we had to check every single ingredient up to 0.01% of every material used in the house. That was a massive work. Um, it led us to use to the use of a lot of natural materials, um, obviously, because it's very hard to get all these ingredients. A lot of manufacturers are not giving those ingredients, but it makes you an advocate for transparency in the material sector, you know. So, yeah, you don't always see that, and uh, but there's a lot of work. And so not just the physical infrastructure, because it is a beautiful place, uh, also, the outdoors, the nature, the permaculture garden, the organic pool, it's, just, it's, a, an, it's really turned out in, into an amazing place. But it's what we learned doing it that is helping us moving forward. And it may, it may, it's, it's a small house, you know, it's a small house, but it can have a big impact. I, we've, we're learning that through inspiration workshops we organize here, volunteers that have been spending time here. We have a volunteering program where we engage with volunteers on regenerative development. Um, doesn't have to be in the built environment. You can regenerate everything, your relationship, your life, whatever project you're working on, your career. And um, so it's more about what happens in a place than, than the actual built infrastructure. How does it impact humans? Uh, what social impact your communities, what new interaction do you develop with nature? And that's, re- you realize that the building is just a, a catalyst for something else to happen. If I would just sit here by myself uh, in my nice energy water efficient building, then, you know, what does it serve? Nothing. So it's, you realize you've got to serve a higher purpose. And that's what we're trying to do with this house. Well, I know you're doing it. I know we've showcased it on a, a big webinar through GBES, or education company. For those listening to the podcast, while this is audio only, I'm going to put a link in the podcast show notes so you can watch the webinar interview and see the visuals and really understand more about what it takes to make a living building. And, and I know part of it, too, is you get to work on some living buildings or some net zero and zero carbon. My team here in the States does but they've got big multi-million dollar budgets. And and luckily it's, hey, what should we be doing? In your case, right? This was your own personal budget and the volunteers helped and it, it's taken some time. So it, I think you've even said it, it means even more to you. It's you were so resourceful to pull this off. And um, so anything to add there? Uh, you've talked about the community, the impact, anyone that visits or learns about it, but just, you know, I know it's tough. It was tough to do this, but you didn't let up. And uh, can you speak to that for a minute? Well, I think uh, one of the frameworks I really like, Charlie, is the one where you have at the bottom the, the, the technology, the materials. And so a lot of our conversations are on that level. And, what, you know, what technology, so we should PV in, uh, materials. And then you have, uh, if you go up a level, then you have the tools level. And I consider a certification a tool or an energy simulation modeling or uh, of carbon uh, calculation. So you use tools. Uh, and so I think most projects work on tools and technology. Uh, but then if you go up another level, you have process. What kind of, because we have a standard process on how to design and build. It's all, it's a standard standards, you know, and you for you know, concept design, produce, you have all these these concepts and, and, and processes. But then you go up one more level and then you have mindset. How do you look at the world and what you're doing? And very rarely, almost never, we work on our mindset. And, we, and very rarely do we work on the process. We use a standard process, which we've been learned and teach and taught, sorry. Um, so going up to that mindset 
first of all, starting from there, how should we be thinking about this project? And taking the time to reflect with deep questions, it's amazing uh, what that does to a project team. The o- well, the only thing, you need to create the opportunity to have the time and the authority to engage with a team to have those kinds of conversations. And But if you can, then you will come to the conclusion that we may have to do things a bit differently, so you have to change your processes. And you can co-create new processes and different ways of doing. And then you go down to tools and technology. A technology without a purpose, so, so oh, is solar energy good? Well, it depends, you know, in, in context. What is it you're trying to do? So that would be my sort of take on it. We have to work more on these other levels. I want a great visual, just the tools and technology that I think we default to, which are already better, but you now processes and then it's mindset. And even earlier in our interview today, you've even used the word systemic. And yeah. I know we're just pushing on what we should be doing. Well, let's talk about the future. If you had a crystal ball, Emmanuel, what's next in this green building movement? Well, I think our conversation so far is a big hint. I can, for me, it's regeneration. I mean, uh, it's, I, it's working from that different mindset. And the signs are on the wall. Oh, investors are no longer looking for short-term profits. They are not stupid. They understand we are, it's not, we're not talking anymore about, well, we are running out of resources. Very soon the conversation will be, oh, we ran out of resources. We have another 25 left, 25 years left uh, for copper. After 20, within 25 years, there's no more copper. What are we using for our electrical wires? Within 25 years, there will be no more phosphor. This is the main fertilizer for the agriculture. So the whole agricultural uh, industry is going to all of a sudden have this today crucial ingredient. So we're going to hit the wall very hard, Charlie, very hard. And unfortunately, as humans, we need to hit the wall first, and then we stand up, so, oh, my God, let's be creative now. And, and, and that's what happens. And we, ha- we have all these systems that don't work. We've got to re- rethink them. So the future is definitely that because the, the, the wall is there. We're going to hit it very hard. So the, all we can try to do is get as much people as possible. It's like, hey, wake up. And then start thinking, okay, because the, the changes are systemic. And it doesn't matter if you talk about the school system, about the political system. Any kind of system is run from a current mindset. And so it starts with living systems thinking, which is a different way of looking at the world. And for me as well, this is something I've learned over the last couple of years. And when you start seeing things differently, you go, you go like, oh my God, I had so many limiting beliefs. We can do things differently. So for me, the future is definitely regeneration. I don't see any other option. Well, I know you're all in on it. So tell us a little more about uh, some coursework you've even taken here later in your career with Regenesis, maybe a a glimpse at some things you personally want to teach. I know we're partnering together on on some things coming up. So everyone listening, be on the lookout for that on the regenerative design. But tell us uh, how you've educated yourself even more on this next step. Well, I started um, with a which is called the TRP, the Regenerative Practitioner Course with Regenesis. Uh, that was a, uh, a life-changing course for me. What I have been engaging with in this course is pr- very practical tools to apply regenerative thinking on projects, on building projects. And it connected with me, so I, for, for me, it was I, I discovered a vocation. And I said, okay, I want to try to get to as many people as possible the tools and the kind of thinking required so that in their projects, they can start working regeneratively. They can make projects in which the focus is how can we make life thrive? And and that's what we're doing, Charlie. That's why I'm so excited to be doing this course with GBES to bring these very practical tools to as many dream building professions as possible. And um, and it starts with, with living systems thinking. And so we will, we will engage with that. So you, we need to think differently. And it doesn't work by just telling people. 
it's it's going to be uh, and we talked about that Charlie it's, it's a whole different way of teaching I don't like it I don't like to call it teaching but it's it's about personal development and it's about those aha moments that you say about well, oh my god now I see something that I didn't see before and that's what we want to do in this course and and then we want to really work with some of the frameworks that I, I learned from regenesis and that I've been I'm apply, I'm applying them so you know we get practical experience in all these projects that I talked about and and I, the more people that have those tools, the more chances we have. Uh, there's going to be some regen- regeneration in other projects. I can just feel your energy. I know you're very excited about this, but there's work to do. And so everyone, please be on the lookout for that. Uh, I just want to agree with the manual. I've been doing this a long time. And, and while many of our projects need to fight to get anywhere close to net zero, the ultimate goal is net positive and, and beyond that is regeneration. So uh, it's, it's, it's not as far out as we might think, but there's still a lot of education first, right? I mean, when we work on a lead project 15 years ago, if we had some lead APs on the project team, it's just easier. We're talking the same language. And I think that's what you're trying to do is your next step is how do we all get to start talking the same language? But what I keep hearing in this interview is the mindset. It's just yeah. the paradigm shift. It's just how do we, maybe not totally hit the wall. It's like, you know, feel like we're already hitting the wall and just go ahead and have that paradigm shift. So, so what's your specialty or gift? What would you say you're really good at? Well, it's funny you ask me, we, we, with the whole team, we had our astral chart read recently. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, but it was wonderful. We have this wonderful person that is really good at inter- making interpretation. And, and so what it, what it helps you do is, is start uh, remembering your essence again, because we forgot that. So who, who are we really? And, and you start resonating. And uh, so through that exercise and also uh, putting that in common with our team, it seems uh, that I'm quite good at, I would say, sourcing information and I'm putting it together, integrating it, in a different way, and then communicating communicating that to other people. So sort of, and and so I, I seem to be good at that. And also, I seem to be able to have a good intuition for what's to come. And with the focus on intuition, I can't really explain why I think some, but it seems to be uh, that I can sort of catch, you know, what, where we're going, what's going to happen. So I think those are gifts. This communication that's why i love teaching and uh and seem to be good at that and uh, and, and and that intuition is so, okay what what do we need to be working on because there's you know some changes coming and what are those changes those are some of your gifts for sure um a few more questions here about you uh how about habits or routines do you have any good habits or routines well my number one routine charlie the most important one when i wake up I get out and I go for a morning walk with the dog. But I'm not doing it only because the dog needs to get out and have a walk. But it's a 20, 30 minute walk before starting the day. It's always in nature because I'm, I'm surrounded by nature. Uh, but it's about setting, in, setting an intention for the day. It gives you 20, 30 minutes to say, okay, what is this day about? What are we going to do? What is it you know, I'm trying to do today? How am I going to be? For doing that uh so this this it's and you can do it with meditation you can do it different ways but i this is my number one uh routine ritual in the morning it doesn't matter if it's cold uh in the summer in the winter going out have that 30 minute walk before uh, and then i have my breakfast and which is also routine but or a ritual but in general the, the routines and rituals i i have in my life are meant to make sure I'm sufficiently grounded. I take time for myself. I, I tend to rush into things. And it's same for you. I mean, we get inundated with emails and messages. And so creating rituals are meant to create those moments where it's like, okay. And one more interesting one, Charlie, which I love the outdoor sauna ritual. I love that one. And uh, yeah, this is so, yeah, I love it. It's a great experience. So I do that regularly. Um, the outdoor sauna and uh it's right there on the property and uh can't wait to uh to see that hopefully soon so just uh the groundedness do you can i ask a follow-up uh do you do you practice 
gratitude or just staying grounded in general, it, it helps you be present. So I'm trying to understand, is it more about being present and have intention for the day? Is it also practicing some gratitude or all that's together? It goes together, Charlie. First, uh, I reflect on, okay, what is it? It goes beyond your agenda, you know. It's, of course, it's based on your agenda. What, what is it? What's, what's here today? I do, what meetings do I have? What I'm trying to do? And you always try to find that level of quality in what you're going to do that day. And then you think about how, how do I need to be? What kind of person do I need to bring to these meetings or this? Uh, be conscious about that. Because sometimes we're tired or we get, ex- we get excited or, or so we, you know. And there is a moment of gratitude by definition because it's always in nature. And, and so I think about things I'm grateful for. So it sort of goes together. It's the same. Mm-hmm. No, thanks for taking us there. And there's one more nugget that, that I totally also agree with is how does that other party want you to show up? Maybe it's the end of the day, your willpower is worn down, but that other party... You know, how do they want you to show up? So I think you're saying, what's it take? Two seconds to just say, you know what? I need to show up like this for this situation. So that's great. This is really good. Let's talk about the bucket list. Emmanuel, I'm a fan of bucket list. Uh, What are one or two things on your bucket list? Is there some adventure, some travel, write a book? What's on the bucket list? Okay. Uh, Well, a bucket list is... I guess it, it's uh, experiences that we want to achieve before we you move kick on. The bucket. Yeah, yeah. So not to be too, um, good, but just what else is out there you'd want to do? Well, for me, for me, Charlie, I have traveled quite a lot. I've lived in five different countries. I've been in about sixty plus countries. Uh, I've traveled quite a lot, and so I, I would say at this this stage in my life, my bucket list list is, is basically find joy in the small everyday things of life it's it's not maybe not as you know everybody has their own bucket list i've seen a lot of the world i'm happy observing small things so that yeah. that's it it's not spectacular but that's for me what's important i don't downplay it I, you know i think i've found that from those i interview those that have traveled to so many countries already they kind of want to be a little closer to here and have that day-to-day impact well, I got to pull one out of you. So with the regenerative design, is there a goal? You said, you know, thousands of people. I mean, you know, what, what kind of bucket list goal would be around regenerative education? Is there a certain number of people you'd like to, to make sure uh, hear your message? In regeneration, we don't like to use metrics. We like to use images to describe experience. What's the perfect image for this one? And... Uh, so, yeah, I can see people coming and going here and learning. And it's like, wow. And then and they talk to other people and it's like and everybody talks about it. I, so it's about potential. It's focusing on potential. So potentially seven billion people, you know, that's the potential. <laughs> so if you want a number. <laughs> no, you gave it to me. I asked for it. Uh, you know, with the image that came to my mind is the butterfly and the butterfly effect and the potential there. And so thank you. Thank you for taking us there. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, books. I'm not sure if you like to listen to books or pick up a hard copy and, you know, read there from your living home in the mountains of Spain. Uh, but is there a book you'd recommend? It doesn't even have to be about green buildings. Well, okay. Uh, well, first of all, I'm buried in books. I got a library here and I'm proud on the fact that most of them I haven't read yet. So that shows the potential of what I can still learn from that library. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit I'm like, I'm really focused on this, on this topic. So I'm, I'm, I, that's, that's who I am. I get obsessed and I still have a lot of books to read, but for those that want to get in touch with this and learn a little bit more about regeneration, I would really like to recommend a book, which I loved uh, which is called Designing for Hope by, uh, I think they're Australian, I'm not sure, and South African, Dominique Hess and Krista Duplessis. Uh, Designing for Hope uh, is, gives a bit of an overview of that whole movement, the mindset, who is working in this area. Well, I liked it very much as an introduction with uh, examples of projects. I also like the book, uh, all the books from Charles Eisenstein, and uh, one book he wrote recently called Climate, A New Story. And uh, I like that as well. 
uh, I know we're lo- talking a lot about sustainability. Carbon is a big topic, but but he just talks about a new story that needs to be born, and and uh, and in the end, it, it is about this new story. I like that as well. I'm reading right now "Responsible Business" from Carol Sanford. Great for any anybody that has a business, including yourself, Charlie. How do I think about my business? How do I make my business like really? Drive uh, using this living systems thinking, and that's what her latest book is about, and it's really very powerful. Is and then really? one more, I think, which I read quite a while ago, but it's called "Designing Regenerative Cultures" from Daniel Wall. He 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 lives in Mallorca in Spain, but he's I don't know what his origin. I think he's German or something. Uh, but that's a really great book, introducing this whole regenerative culture and. Um, yeah, I, those are some books that really, from all the things I've read, I liked for somebody that wants to get into this area. So those I can recommend. Those are fantastic recommendations. I'm going to put links to each one in our podcast show notes. so Everybody can go check out and get a copy of these books. We'll also link, of course, to the webinar about Cal Uh I mean, you know, two more questions. Uh, sometimes those listening are just now getting into this green building movement. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's someone, maybe a recent college grad, or sometimes it's maybe a, a later chapter in their career, like your story. But yeah. what advice do you wish you'd have known a little earlier in your career? Well, uh, I'm sure my previous career, you know, has had its benefits, but I wish I would have started but then, you know, the times were different as well. So I would say if you, if you want to get into this business, this field, go straight to regenerative because that's, that's where the work is. Uh, and work from what you really care about because it is going against mainstream still. Uh, and you're going to need a lot of energy uh, to keep going. And one of the major sources of energy is something inside of you that you really care about. So if you work from a place of care and love for something and you put in your own personality in it, don't try to do what is expected from you. Just try to put in your, who you are. Uh, that's going to give you the energy to keep going. That's when people say, oh, he's, he's not like all the others because you're yourself. And because you get tired not being yourself, you know? So try to think. And, and there's a very nice story in the book of uh, Carol Sanford in this. And it's, I'll, I'll tell it very quickly. It's not my story. It's her story. It's a guy that was doing uh, food catering at weddings. Tough business. A lot of personnel turnover. His essence was talking and listening to clients. Uh, end of the story is he changed his business, going back to his essence. His business is now interviewing these people that are getting married and their families, listening to their stories. And what they do during the wedding is doing theater, singing with the stories of these people, creating a whole spectacle. And yes, they also serve food. His business is thriving. He's got a waiting list. He, his prices went up. He, is, he has no more personnel turnover. Why? Because he reconnected what, who he, what he really likes to do and he put that essence into this business. So that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Be yourself and, it's just, and work from something you're really passionate about, and then you'll be really good. Oh, wow. That was awesome. And I know our previous jobs and careers, you know, in your case, you got to travel the world, see cultures. You got to understand the U.S. and how to do business here. I'm sure it helps you with your real estate clients and how to handle that side of it. But sometimes we also learn what do we want to do and what do we not want to do, right? And so that's part of those previous experiences. But um, I think uh, that's another vote for this book. So lastly, as we start to wrap up here, let's just say someone is jumping in right now. They're getting inspired by hearing your story, Emmanuel. Uh, what words of encouragement do you have for them? I would say there is a f- this is a field where this, this is only growing. And you may not know exactly what role you're going to be playing in this field, but you should never be scared because there's so much things that can be done. When I started, I wanted to be a developer. And so I didn't, you know, there's not enough time here to tell the whole story, but, but eventually I found my position or role in this whole thing. And, and that took time. And I wondered 
oh, I, you know, is my, am I going to be successful? I'm going to, I'm, we'll be able to, you know, get a salary from this or make a living of this. So that you should not be afraid of that because there is so much need for this and it's growing. Just keep, keep looking because you can't, you really can't fail. You'll, you'll stumble a couple of times. Yeah. But eventually there's so much opportunity in this field and so much need. So don't be afraid. Just go. Yo, it's a very welcoming community, the green building movement. There's a lot of entryway points, and I'm just uh, really inspired today by our conversation. So everyone, please reach out, connect with Emmanuel on LinkedIn. We'll put some of his information down there. But this has been Emmanuel Powell. coming to us from Barcelona, Spain, and he is an entrepreneur in this green building movement. He's got an amazing team, and he calls himself, and he is a regenerative practitioner. Emmanuel, thanks for your time today. Wonderful talking to you, Charlie. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you to our loyal listeners. We actually are celebrating over one year here on the Green Building Matters podcast. Me and the entire team were stoked and just so glad you continue to listen every Wednesday morning to a new interview with a green building professional here in this industry or just some pro tips that we want to make sure that you are getting straight from us, straight to you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.